This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 8th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Dukes Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets, Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, a Ketchikan Daily News op-ed has it right. The Alaska legislature should focus on the economy but the legislature isn't. Second, oil prices are going up, but not nearly enough to dig the state out of its hole. Third, like his predecessors, the governor has begun using the gas line as a diversion. And now let's join Michael. He's going to start off today in the weekly top three with a piece out of the Ketchikan Daily News, which ironically nobody can read unless you absolutely subscribe to it. But I'm sure Brad will give us a synopsis of the opinion piece there in the Ketchikan Daily News that he says has it right, but that doesn't matter because the legislature is going to ignore it. Good morning, Brad. What's on your mind? I took a break from reading the Anchorage Daily News op-ed page, uh, which uh, sometimes gets a little bit more depressing than other times. I I think... uh, I think I've had the, the Anchorage Daily News op-ed page as, as part of the top three for the past three weeks running. Right, That's, right. You know, at, at, at some point, you just sort of got to look for another source. Um, and Catch Can Daily News, which is interesting reading. Uh, I, I didn't realize you had to subscribe to read anything on it, but it is always interesting reading to me. Um, good news from Southeast. I mean, it's a good news source from Southeast. Uh, had uh, an op-ed that I think is, uh, is 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 a good counterpoint in in many ways to what we see out of the Anchorage Daily News. The the headline of the op-ed is focus on the economy, uh, and the first paragraph of the of the op-ed is the budget will be the legislature's main topic, and the major point should be the economic recovery of Alaska. Uh, and I think the I think the the, the op-ed captures a, a really important point uh, that, uh, that that sometimes a lot of times we miss and the legis- and a lot of legislators are missing, uh, which is the the real the real focus of the legislature should be on the Alaska economy uh, and Alaska families and how they're doing. Uh, and 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 taking steps in the in the legislature to promote that. Now, a lot of times you'll get people uh, in the legislature that will say, "Well, we're doing that. You know, we're making sure that government's functioning, and you know, government's doing this, and government's doing that, and government's doing the other thing, and all that's necessary to the economy." But that's not really focusing on the economy. That's really focusing on the government first and right. assuming that there will be knock on positive effects, uh, uh, knock on positive effects on the economy, and that's not. That's not always the case. It, I, I will say that even even the the, the Catch Can Daily News op-ed sort of loses its own point uh, at some point in the in the op-ed because they talk about one of the positive effects that could that could that could happen into the economy is government investment in a um, in a renewable energy project that they've got down there. Now they're talking about it in terms of jobs that it would generate jobs, but. But still, it's government spending uh, that uh, that that they're advocate, advocating. Right. But by and large, before they before they get to that end point, they're talking about they're talking about positive things that the government ought to focus on the economy. And they and they talk about those things. I mean, which is again refreshing because it seems like everything else, every other op ed has been talking about how we need to talk about prote- how do we protect the government, how do we protect the services, how do we protect that spending. At whatever the expense to the rest of the economy is. Yeah, exactly right. 
and 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 the focus. I mean, here here's where the 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 daily the Catch Can Daily News op-ed doesn't go that I would think that that I think it should, and that I think that that the legislature should when they're focusing on these things, and that is it, the, the 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 focus on the economy should not only be at the level of how much does government spend, um, uh, and and on what on what projects. Uh, does government spend or should government not spend? Uh, but the but the thing that that I think is equally as important uh, is if government needs additional revenues, who pays those revenues? Uh, the because we know that there are different impacts on the economy from different sources of revenue. We know from the from the 2016 ICER study that that funding government through PFD cuts has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy and on Alaska families uh, of any of the revenue sources uh, that ICER took a look at uh, at the time, which was a, which was a broad range of, of revenue sources. We know that there are adverse impacts on the economy uh, and on Alaska families from 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 that from using that as the revenue source, and that. And that while there are impacts, they are there are lesser impacts on the overall economy from using uh, other revenue sources. The the so so when you have a focus on the economy, it needs to permeate all of the things you're looking at. Not only the the how much you spend uh, as a government, but all, and not only on what projects you spend it as a government. Um, uh, but also on who is paying uh, for uh, those projects and how they're paying, what revenue uh, measures you're using. And, and Michael, the thing that really frustrates me about about the about the legislature, oftentimes, is that they don't focus on who pays at all. I mean, you get a whole discussion going in Senate Finance, for example, where. Senator Von Imhoff or someone goes off on the PFD and how, you know, the PFD is, we've, we've got to rate in the PFD. We've got to, you know, use those, that, use that money for government spending. And there's no discussion at the table or indeed in, in follow-up, there's no discussion about the impact of using that revenue source uh, on, on the overall economy. And so when, 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 when you see people talking about, well, we need to focus on the economy, um, I think that's exactly right, uh, and I think it's a I think it's a discussion that a, a, a topic that certainly should permeate the discussion of how much government spends uh, and what projects government spends uh, their money on. But it's equally a topic that needs to permeate an issue that needs to permeate the discussion of uh, of who pays as well. And if I if I'm gonna if I if, if there's any fault to the Catch Can Daily News uh, op-ed is that that they didn't they didn't grab hold of that level also. They didn't talk about uh, the impact on the economy of, of who pays. And uh, as I said, I think it's an equally important issue because you can have you, you can have large adverse impacts on the overall economy uh, uh, picking a revenue source. I mean, PFD cuts is, is the best example. Uh, you know, looking at the ICER study, they have the largest adverse impact on the overall economy in Alaska families. But there's other revenue sources that that uh, that have uh, uh, similar impacts. Uh, sales taxes, statewide sales tax, uh, uh, would have a, a similar adverse impact on uh, on the economy and on Alaska families. So you've got it. You've got it. You've got it. That that issue of focusing on the economy needs to permeate all of the topics uh, that you're talking about. Now, what do you say to people? I know that again, we got folks in the chat room who are like, "Oh, you're just blaming the top twenty percent. You're just." You know, they're the evil ones or whatever. But, I mean, I think this is a valid question. This is a valid concern. This has been part of the problem is that as long as the permanent fund dividend is there and it's going to be a, uh, a you know, a viable option for people to draw from and they feel like they're not, they're not uh, you know, they're not paying the rent on it, so to speak, then they're all okay, so it doesn't really matter. And and I think that that is, I think that's an important, uh, I think that's an important point, though, to to, uh, to try and make. It is. They, I mean, let's be honest. They aren't paying. They aren't contributing. The top twenty percent isn't contributing uh, a material amount when uh, when you use uh, when you use PFD cuts. I'm not I'm not blaming them in the sense that uh, uh, that, that somehow you know they're 
they're they're escaping. Uh, 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 well, they're using they're using. Well, actually, I am blaming them. I mean, it, 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 the, the top 20 percent legislators in the legislature are, are affirmatively trying to shove these costs off on middle and lower income uh, Alaska families. They're trying to dodge uh, paying a, a proportionate share uh, uh, themselves of, of the cost of government. And as long as they can do that, I mean, we've been through this on the show a lot. But as long as they can do that, they don't feel the cost of government. They don't. They don't have an incentive. They and their donor class don't have an incentive to uh, uh, to, to get the cost of government under control because they're they're not they're not paying a portion of it uh, themselves. So i I think it's I think it's an I think it's highly irrelevant highly relevant uh, point uh, about who pays and the impact on who pays and and how that uh, influences uh, influences their judgment. And, of course, uh, as we look at this, we've talked in the past, of course, about getting that skin in the game. And if they had skin in the game, maybe, just maybe, the political will would all of a sudden magically develop to actually live within our means. Yep, I, 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 I firmly believe that. I mean, no one, no one wants to use their political capital unless it's in their own self-interest uh, to do so. The top 20%. Uh, aren't going to use their political capital to go up against those who believe in big government uh, to reduce the cost of government as long as they don't as long as the top 20 percent doesn't have to pay the cost of government right it's 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 it's, it's simple <clears throat> it's simple incentives um, you hit them as hard as middle and lower income Alaska families are I mean it's largely you know it's largely middle and lower income Alaska families who have pushed back on the cost of government because they're seeing the impact of that. In terms of reduced uh, PFD costs, I mean the top twenty percent will pay lip service to it, but they're not using their political political capital. They're not using their influence at the legislature to to push back on the on the costs. In, in, instead, I mean if you look at the op eds from uh, from Keep Alaska Competitive and, and 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 others, instead what they're doing is they're using their political capital to to keep the pressure to 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 make the Payments come from uh, from reduced PFDs to to, right. to 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 keep the revenue going from reduced PFDs. So they're 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 using their political capital. It's just to push the costs off on somebody else. If we spread the cost burden to include that top twenty percent, uh, it would create an incentive on their part to push back on costs as opposed to try to push the burden off on uh, on someone else. We'll go back to the chat room here and take a few questions or comments. Where can we join the top 20% club? Well, I guess you just have to keep working away at it uh, and uh, and keep it at it. You could probably get there one day. Um, let's see. I thought Harold was the only one who thought oil prices would go up. Brad can't have it both ways. Brad said oil prices would go up, but he did, I don't think he said that it was going to go up as much as Harold thought it was going to go up. But, I mean, these things were bound to happen. The second that Biden shut down all that other stuff, you could see that oil prices on the horizon were going to start to go up. And, of course, Brad will get into the mechanisms for all that here in a minute. Um, No one I know in the legislature thinks one whit about how our decision will affect our situation. Pressure comes from our districts, the people that elect us. Uh, Some districts don't care about the PFD. They just don't want taxes. Some want the PFD and are willing to pay taxes. Uh, I guess that's part of the discussion, right, Brad? It is, uh, and and certainly you've got districts like uh, Jennifer Johnson's old district, or uh, or Senator von Imhoff's district that are wealthier uh, and have different uh, different uh, incentives than uh, than uh, 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 than than other districts. But the legislators themselves. I mean, one of the things that really drives me when I when I you know break down the legislature, the legislators themselves. Uh, largely are in the top 20 percent. The last time I did the analysis, over 80 percent of the legislature uh, was in the top 20 percent, and you, and and that can't help but but have some influence uh, on their thinking. I mean, they sit there and go, PFD. Well, the PFD is not that important to me. Um, uh, yeah, at the margin, you know, maybe it means I I don't get to take a vacation or or don't have you know can't spend on on a on on a restaurant as much as as much as I want to. But it's but it's a marginal impact as opposed to the more core impact it has on middle and lower income Alaska families, and we just don't have that many middle and lower income uh, Alaskans uh, in the legislature. So 
it, it's in part an influence of their districts, but it's also in part an influence of, of the legislators. Um, own backgrounds uh, in uh, in how they feel about the right, issues. and I'd like to point out that this doesn't make them evil. It just means that people are influenced by their own biases. That's just how it is. I mean, it's, you know, there's just no, uh, you know, there's no, uh, 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 there's not not attributing any kind of good versus evil idea. It's just that that's the perspective that they come from. And if you are already in that top twenty percent. You can identify with that, and you can understand it because you're there. So, again, it doesn't make anybody evil, but it doesn't make it any easier to try and see the perspective of those people who $30,000 a year is a big year. Yeah, and and the thing, Michael, I mean, you get legislators who talk about, oh, I'm all about the economy, and I'm all about economic impact, and I'm and, and that's what I really think about here at the legislature, and that's what, 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 uh, what motivates my votes. But it's not true when it comes to – when it comes to the issue of who pays, when it, when you get to the issue of who pays, it, it the the incentives change, uh, and it's more about you know who who is going to pay, and, and let's make sure it's not me, and, and and hearing from my donors, let's make sure it's not my my donor class that pays. The the point that I think I think that that, that I, I want to stress, and that I think the Catch Can Daily News op-ed sets up is who pays is as much an economic issue as anything else. Who pays has as much an impact on the overall Alaska economy and on Alaska families as, as how much is being paid and what projects it's being, it's being put to work. And so when you say you're all about the economy and you're all about economic impact, you need to take that into account. As a legislator, you should take that into account uh, when you consider the question of who pays uh, as well as, uh, as as the other things. Well, and ironically, I see Kevin McCabe uh, uh, is here in the in the chat room with us, and he says, and none of us care about that. That part is total BS, Brad, not even a consideration. But just a moment before, you said pressure comes from our districts. The people that elect some districts don't care about the PFD. They just don't want taxes. No one I know in the legislature thinks one would about how the decision will affect our situations, our own situations. But, I mean, if you are – hearing from people in your districts and you're feeling pressure from people in your districts, then again, that is part of the problem. I mean, that is, none of you care about that unless your districts are pushing back hard on you. And I think that's what Brad's saying is your constituency class is saying, you don't do that to us because we care about the PFD or we don't care about the PFD. I think it is a factor in there. Yeah. It's, it, 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 I, I mean, all you have to do is listen to Natasha. Uh, there, in, in 2017, when this first issue, when the PFD issue first started, first started coming up, Natasha gave an interview to the Anchorage Daily News, and and basically her uh, her argument was, you can't you, you can't tax us, you have to cut the PFD because if you tax the top 20 percent, they'll leave, right? Uh, or, or or you know they'll they'll do less business or 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 something of the sort. It is, I mean, she's driven. By the impact of, of fifteen seconds, of alternative revenue sources on uh, on the top twenty percent. Yeah, you, you can't you can't deny that. Yeah, no, I think that that is part of the point here. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're just finishing up with number one of the weekly top three. Brad, let's talk briefly about number two and uh, and give us a, a bit of a tease here before we go to break. Well, oil prices are going up. Um, uh, they have. Uh, Run up significantly since uh, uh, since the first of the year, uh, largely driven by what OPEC's been doing in terms of cutting back, and in Saudi in particular, in terms of cutting back uh, on production levels. And as oil prices have gone up, I've I've heard some say, well, maybe you know, maybe Alaska is going to dodge the bullet again. Maybe we're going to have oil revenues that that enable us to. Uh, to avoid biting the bullet on uh, on either cutting the cost of government or or paying for government equitably, um, and and it's good that oil prices are going up, and we can and we can talk about you know that as a as a as a good thing for the state, but it's not going to solve the problem. And, right. Uh, and in the, in the second segment, we're going to sort of dive down into the numbers and talk about why not. We're on a number two, which is oil prices are headed up. 
And that's good, but Brad says nowhere near good enough. I know we've had some speculation that oil prices could get into the 85 to $90 range, uh, but Brad's going to break some of that down for us and give us his thoughts on it. Brad, where are we at? Well, since Saudi made the decision uh, going into the first uh, quarter that they were going to continue to, uh, to cut back production, even, even as OPEC generally, OPEC plus, which includes the Russians, generally – uh, ratcheted up production some in the first quarter. Saudi, uh, in order to uh, to resolve an internal OPEC issue, uh, uh, held down uh, its production. Uh, there's about 8 million barrels a day uh, of uh, OPEC production that's not on the market, that's being withheld from the market, uh, uh, largely driven by uh, the Saudi decision. There's some cutbacks also of other OPEC members, but, but Saudi has cut, cut that back. As demand has started to recover uh, uh, coming out of uh, coming out of COVID, not fully recovered by any stretch of the imagination, but as it started to recover, that OPEC cutback uh, has re- resulted in uh, a reduction in the stocks uh, in the in the oil uh, stored, and has resulted in an increase in price. Uh, and that price is now, you know, the, the price has come up to sixty dollars. Uh, there's a barrel for Brent. There's a lot of, of discussion about what happens in the second quarter. Uh, it, does Saudi extend its cut? Does it voluntarily extend its cut, uh, which would continue to support price? The growing consensus is that Saudi's unlikely to do that. Saudi's com- comfortable with a lower price, uh, and now it's getting concerned about market share. There's also um, uh, a growing focus on what $60 oil is going to do to U.S. production, do uh, uh, shale producers who have cut back significantly on investment and on production, do they start going back in and completing wells that have been left uncompleted and, and drilling additional wells to bring U.S. production uh, back up, which had fallen, uh, has fallen during COVID and during the, during the, uh, the price depression. So there's a lot of a lot of factors at play that really are sort of pushing against that six dollar price over the long term. And if you look at the uh, when you look at the futures markets, <clears throat> the futures markets continue in significant what's called backwardation, which is that uh, prices uh, go down uh, as as you go out in time. By the time you get you know, a, a couple of years out, prices are in the fifty dollar level, mid fifty dollar level. Uh, in the futures market, because the market is the market expectation is that uh, that there's more forces at work to bring prices down than uh, than to push prices up. But but nevertheless, right now, uh, oil prices are around the sixty dollar uh, mark, and uh, and that does mean some increase uh, in uh, in state revenues. But it's not it's it's not approaching the level. That, that gets us gets us out of the the current uh, economic condition. Uh, every year, uh, as part of the fall revenue sources book, uh, the Department of Revenue publishes a table uh, that uh, that looks at the the state revenues, unrestricted general fund revenues, uh, at certain price levels, um, and it's and it's a very useful tool to look at to to figure out what prices are. Uh, what what impact higher prices are going to be? Right. The 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 FY22 uh, uh, budget is predicated on uh, and the, and the deficit levels that we've been talking about is predicated on a on an average price of forty eight dollars for the year. Uh, that produces one point two billion dollars in uh, in unrestricted general funds. If you get up to sixty dollars, um, uh, the FY20 the the table tells you that. We get 360 million dollars more that the, the that the unrestricted general funds are 1.56 billion, as opposed to 1.2 billion. You have to remember, though, that even with Governor Dunleavy's uh, uh, spending cuts, proposed spending cuts, which have which have not gotten good reception in Senate Finance, at least, but even with those spending cuts, we're still about a billion dollars in the hole every year, uh, uh, looking out over the next 10 years. So to get to, to get that billion dollars out of increased oil uh, 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 revenues, we would have to jump from forty-eight dollars to nearly ninety dollars uh, a barrel, averaged over the course of the entire year, uh, and that would give you revenues of two point five billion dollars, 
uh, enough to, to, to cover the uh, uh, to cover the billion dollar deficit that we have uh, in the budget. But then we'd have to sustain that ninety dollars uh, uh, ninety dollars plus over the over the ten years in order to cover the the budget deficit over that entire period of time. And even the most even the most um, uh, 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 excited uh, uh, people in the oil market, uh, no one's estimating, no one's projecting that we get ninety dollars over the course of the next uh, ten years. And again, as I say, uh, the futures market is telling us that oil prices uh, go down. Uh, the farther out in, the, in time we go, the farther away we get from uh, the current situation. So there's no white knight coming over the hill of these high oil prices coming to fix it. And I think Jimmy makes a valid point that no matter what the oil prices are, the baseline problem is that we still have a spending problem in this state. If the money is there, there you go. Yep, exactly right. And 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 that that that's proven to be the case even if even when oil prices go down in oil revenues. Uh, go down, but but for those who think oil prices are, are coming to save the day, uh, they'll they'll cut into the deficit some. They'll they'll lessen uh, the uh, the scope of the problem, but we're still talking about uh, huge uh, uh, budget deficits. I mean, we're right. talking about 15 to 20 percent of the budget uh, every year being uh, being in deficit, and and oil prices at sixty dollars while they're nice. Um, uh, and while they may provide some incentive for additional drilling uh, on the North Slope that otherwise isn't occurring, uh, they're 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 not going to generate the kind of revenues that get us out of the state budget situation. Well, let's move on to number three here. We'll actually see if we can get all three in today. Uh, the governor's proposed gas line uh, is most fairly described, as you say, as an attempted attention diverter. It's not real. Uh, give, give us your pitch on this here. Well, when you dig in, I mean, the governor's recently made, recently wrote an op-ed, uh, and there's been some news stories about uh, increased focus or re- increased attention again to the to the North Slope uh, gas line. In this case, they're talking about uh, a line that would run from the North Slope, starting with a line that would run from the North Slope down to uh, down to uh, Fairbanks or near Fairbanks, and then have a spur line that would go off the go off the main line uh, down to Fairbanks, but but sort of stopping the line. Uh, at Fairbanks, and the, and the argument is, well, that's a five billion dollar, it's a five billion dollar project. Uh, that's lower cost project, uh, and uh, and and you know the governor's op-ed and and various activities have tried to generate uh, some excitement around that. Uh, it's it's no more realistic than than the gas line has been uh, uh, before. Yes, it's a lower cost. Five billion is less than 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 thirty five billion or forty billion, which is the cost of the full line. But the volumes of just going to Fairbanks are much 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 smaller, uh, and the per unit cost, which is really how you look at the competitiveness of these things, the per unit cost uh, of just going to Fairbanks is much higher um, uh, than it is uh, of, uh, of, of 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 the big line. So the 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 the, the charge that Fairbanks and the, the, the Fairbanksians would have to pay. Uh, uh, for for gas coming from that kind of line would be would be huge. The, the, when you when you look at the at the explanation of how they would finance the line, uh, also four billion dollars of it would come from supposedly would come from the federal government as part of the as part of the federal government's infrastructure package. You know, if the, if the federal government is going to have an infrastructure infrastructure package, there's probably a lot better ways to spend. Uh, if Alaska is going to get four billion dollars, there's a lot better ways to spend that four billion dollars, like fixing our, uh, uh, our our deferred maintenance on on our buildings. A lot better ways to spend that four billion dollars than on a than on a, uh, a gas line that's that's going to produce an uncompetitive price, uh, even if it uh, even if it gets built. Well, so, that, that's always been the problem. Is this is a velocity thing? This is a quantity thing. I mean, not a there's not enough people in just the interior to make it worth the while for the volume that would be pulled on there. Even if you if, even if you brought the volume to the entire state, there would barely be enough. You have to have it for in-state use and for export to make it financially viable. Is that correct? Exactly right. And, 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 and you know, the, 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 now we've got, now that we're talking about a project that has the federal government uh, financing most of it as opposed to either uh, producers or customers, LNG customers, 
Um, and it's just a, a, I, the governor wants good news. The governor wants to bring good news to Alaskans, and I and I applaud him for that. But this is sort of made up good news. I mean, the, some of us remember the old 2000s movie Up, uh, the Pixar movie, and uh, and and in that movie you you've got a squirrel that keeps showing up that diverts attention. Um, and uh, and this is just another squirrel. This is, this squirrel. Is, squirrel. Yeah, exactly right. Squirrel. It's a shiny object in the other side of the room. I love this. Brad has no idea about the economics surrounding the proposal for the Fairbanks gas line. Uh, well, first of all, I would disagree. Second of all, I'm pretty familiar with it since I was part of the discussions on this uh, early on. Uh, having the gas line go strictly to Fairbanks is, I mean, it does not make for an economic solution. Not at $5 billion. I mean, literally, for a gas line uh, to be able to do that, you have to be able to feed, first of all, and, and there's been some argument that, okay, it doesn't have to make money. All right, well, I'm all about that as far as the Section 8 of the Constitution says, developing the resources to the maximum benefit of the people, that it could be argued that delivering gas at a loss to the people is still an economically viable thing uh, based on the Constitution. But the, the economics, you still have to pay for it. You still have to pay for the line. You still have to pay for the infrastructure. You still have to pay, I mean, all that stuff. And you couldn't develop enough demand in the entire state to be able to make it economically feasible. That, I mean, that's just a fact. There's no doubt about it. Now, inside the state use and export, it could be doable. But that's what it's going to take. I mean, Brad, am I, am, it, point, point me where I'm wrong here. No, Michael, I've worked on a lot of projects uh, related, to, uh, related to monetizing North Slope gas. Uh, over over my career and the and the economics always are are very marginal even when you look at uh, uh, look at uh, export projects even when you look at that big volume export projects I mean the the net back to the, the North Slope gas supply is in the is is in the uh, 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 pennies it's not in the, it's not in in any significant sum uh, so you are just sort of trying to trying to break even to to be able to monetize the gas for for just a little bit, but that's a, that's at huge volumes. There's uh, there's the economics have never panned out uh, when you're looking at uh, just a, uh, just a project to to either just uh, 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 Fairbanks or even Fairbanks uh, plus Alaska, even or Fairbanks plus Anchorage, even Anchorage, uh, you know, can, uh, shutting down the Cook Inlet gas supply and powering all of of anchorage with uh, with North Slope gas, you just don't get to a volume that that brings the uh, the BTU cost, the, the per unit cost, uh, down low enough. Right. It, it it it's a lot more economic as as marginal as the economics are. It's a lot more economic for Fairbanks to to use Cook Inlet gas, uh, convert it to LNG, truck it up the uh, the highway to Fairbanks, store it in LNG tanks in the Fairbanks, regasify it. Uh, and uh, and distribute it. It's a lot more economic to do that than it is to build uh, a pipeline down from the North Slope to Fairbanks. Well, and of course, as economics go, none of that takes into account the actual conversion costs and everything else. That's all on the people. But still, there's a significant cost to the people on top of it. The big problem with trucking gas to the interior is we found out that when you have small players, they will they will always just sell the gas at a price that's just under whatever heating oil is at the time. So it's not even like you're saving a ton of money on that when you factor in conversion costs and everything else it's 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 pretty crazy yeah and 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 so i mean again the governor wants to deliver good news i'm i'm all about you know uh delivering good news but this is this is just a uh, this is more a diversion than the old walker projects at least the old walker projects still had the producers involved uh uh in them uh even the last walker project the producers were still contributing and the producers were still uh, part of the uh, are, are part of the effort to try to you know bring the uh, the project costs down. Now we don't even have the producers involved. We have this we have this unnamed potential uh, participant, but the potential participant is a is a pipeline company that's looking to make money off of off of uh, uh, off of uh, 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 you know being the lead on the project and getting money out of getting money in that way, like a consultant. Uh, right. They're not they're not looking at making the project economic. So it's. It's it's a 
it's a it's a nice thing to talk about. It's a great thing to write an op-ed about and say, look, you know, uh, look at look over here, look over here. This is you know we're doing good things over here. But it's just it's a diversion tactic. Uh, it's not a it's not a realistic project. Well, it's almost as if, <clears throat> again, going back to SB fifty seven or fifty nine, whatever it was, when they were talking about converting the four hundred million dollars in taxes from the slopes. I mean, it's a good idea, but the viability of it is pretty low, and so you could throw it out there all you want, but unless it's actually doable, it's uh, it's much ado about nothing at this point, which I think is kind of what we're looking at. I mean, we need to make those kind of things happen, but it's not going to happen this year. Yeah, and I think the one danger of it is is saying, you know, this is where we want our, if we get infrastructure infrastructure dollars from the feds, this is where we want our infrastructure dollars to go. Uh, and I think that's dangerous. I, there's a lot better use for our infrastructure dollars. If we're going to get infrastructure dollars from the feds, there's a lot better use for those infrastructure dollars than, than putting it into a, a white elephant uh, uh, project like that. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, uh, as always, uh, interesting discussion, um, and I uh, look forward to seeing what uh, ne- w- next week brings. We'll see if we actually are under a uh, organized legislature next week. <laughs> There's always hope, isn't there? Well, I got, I got, a, I got a, a thing yesterday. Shelly Hughes, she went on record as saying her gambling, her odds are uh, 70% that we get an organization this week, but... Uh, We'll have to see. I, I I wouldn't be willing to put money at it on that odds, so we'll see what happens. You know, the one driver is the emergency, uh, the extension of the emergency proclamation. Right. And that's that, that's probably that, that should drive some activity, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. All right. Well, Brad, thank you so much for coming on board and joining us. I appreciate you being part of it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.